Welcome back everybody to Pole Barn Garage. We're back out here with my 72 Le Mans that I've had since high school and we're getting ready to put an entire stage 2 UMI handling kit in this thing. Major upgrades and to make this car what I've really always wanted it to be. This is the stage 2 handling kit from UMI. It retails at just under $3,000 and that's including the Bilstein shocks and everything you see here. This is every single suspension component for the car. It's probably one of the more budget oriented companies out there and everything here is made in the USA and the, well except for the Bilsteins those are made in Germany but whatever. Now I do have two add-ons here that I added in there. This is a rear shock tower brace, chassis stiffening brace and that is a front chassis stiffening brace. I added those in. I've always envisioned this car as being a good autocross car. As we dig into it you're going to see a lot of stuff that 18, 19 year old Dalton did to try to squeeze some cornering capability out of this car. I forgot to mention the exhaust fell off of this thing. We'll have to fix that too. It should go without saying, but when you jack your car up to do suspension work to it, you need to make sure the suspension is unloaded. So put your stands under the frame or the chassis of the car so everything kind of droops. Now the car is more or less supported securely. What the car currently has is some Chinese eBay control arms. They've been in there for about 10 years. I will say they're not terrible if you replace the ball joints. The ball joints they come with will kill you, and that should be indicative of the quality of them anyway. <laughs> and then I've converted the car to four-wheel discs. Uh, looks like the rear brakes aren't working at all. So that's a problem for another day, but we'll remember that. And the front sway bar in this car is a 1979 Z28 sway bar. It's about as big as they get for a factory sway bar and it bolts right into an A-body. On the rear, we have a factory rear one inch sway bar, box lower control arms, UMI upper control arms. These are factory height springs in the back and a one inch lowering UMI spring in the front. So there is some UMI stuff in the car already. Frankly, I used them 10 years ago because it was good stuff that I could actually afford. I couldn't afford the whole kit and caboodle back then. And I was, you know, not good enough with my money to save it, you know. But I was able to buy a few key pieces. I'm gonna start on the front, I think. So, first step is just remove the calipers and pop the rotors off, you know, take all that stuff. It hasn't been that long since I've been in here. In fact, I put brakes in it not that long ago. I did buy all new steering components for it. Pick that up on my own, you know. While I'm in here, why not go ahead and replace all that? One thing, when I take calipers off of cars, I don't leave them hanging by the hoses. Do I need pads? Nah, these are fine. Don't mind leaving them dangling here for just a second. I'll use some bailing wire and just kind of hang it up off of something. God, it's hot out here. Ain't no country club resort shops on this channel, I can tell you that. But I'm just grateful for what I got. Now this car was originally a drum brake car, and when I was 18 on my way to work at the plant, I spotted a 72 Le Mans sitting in a upholstery shop's parking lot that was being parted out, I could tell. And uh, <clears throat> sure enough, it was a disc brake car, so this is all... GM stuff in here. Oh god. Oh, that reminds me. So I bought new rotors for this thing. That's a good thing. See this groove cut in here? It's actually really bad. What happened was, is my girlfriend and I were on our way back from the drive-in when I was about 19, 20, and the spindle bolt backed out. And this, I don't know if I replaced the bolt or not, but it actually backed out and it sits like right here. So this spot is much lower than over here and it just drug and just cut through there. Car st we were flying down some back highway and it started making this horrible noise and sure enough that's what it was. Back then I didn't have the money to put a rotor on it but at least I was able to swing enough for a couple of them now. You served me well, rotor. Before I dig in here too far, I'm going to take a little super clean, clean off these back of the plates, all the brake dust, road grime and stuff like that, make my life a little bit better. Not much better, but a little bit better. We're going to remove the spindle. You do need to use a little bit of caution 
when removing a spindle because there's a spring in an A body car, obviously, and the lower control arm captures the bottom of the spring and you know goes up into the frame pocket. So it's under tension. It's under less tension because we did put the car up and let the suspension drop, but there's no, there's still some tension there, and you should use caution. I won't, but you should. We'll unbolt the shock and the tie rod, and then once we start undoing the ball joints, then we're going to put a jack under it and just try to let it down slowly. And then when you die and you show up and St. Peter goes, what happened, man? And you go, well, you know, I tried. And they'll go, well, you know, all right. Let's see if I get lucky and they just unbolt. Nice. I think these shocks are still good, so I'd like to save them. I don't even know what these things are. Monroe Maddox or something like that. Are they any good? Oh yeah, these are still good. Good to keep them, that's for sure. We're gonna get the tire rod out of here. So something in the front end of this thing is bent and it was pulling really hard. I don't know what it is, but I imagine we're gonna find it at some point here. I hope we do. Go on, let go of it now. Or don't at all, you know, that's fine too. Let go of it. This is actually a ball joint separator, not a pickle fork. So that may be why. Well, I'm gonna have to go get a, a proper tie rod separator. Uh, that ball joint separator won't do it on this one for some reason. I'm gonna go ahead and pull the sway bar out while I'm here. I got both end links unbolted. And then you just have your bushings that bolt direct to the frame. We'll definitely be keeping this around. Maybe put it on the Holy Goat for an upgrade. Ah, yes. A 15 millimeter. Of course it is. That's 18 year old Dalton at work right there. Well, and 30 year old Dalton. Ah. I couldn't afford the real thing. I painted it red, put the sticker on it, and then clear coated the whole thing. And that, that's held up really well for 10 years of abuse. Nobody would have ever known that it wasn't the real deal. Off on a parts run to the Jag. Picked up a tie rod separator, got that apart. The only difference here Ball joint separators are a little wider and the tie rod separator is narrower. We got floor jack under here to support the lower control arm. First thing we're going to do is just take out the nuts that secure the ball joints onto the spindle. They make a really nice spring compressor that goes through the lower control arm up into the frame pocket. And I have one and you could use that. But since I know these are already lowering springs, uh, they're pretty short. So now we will use the ball joint separator and I'm going to go for the upper first. Come with me if you want to live. Got it. Slowly lower the jack. Oh, good. The spring just stayed up in there. So now we get to be dangerous. Hooray! <laughs> Woo Look at that. Look at that spring insulator. Waste. Anyway, I'm gonna go ahead and pop this stuff out. Just two bolts on the lower control arm and then two bolts that secure the upper control arm to that little cross shaft up there. Thankfully, this stuff isn't very stuck. It's all good hardware and, you know, 10 years old or so. Sure beats the hell out of the 30, 40, 50 year old stuff I'm usually working with. Time to go. Curious what these bushings look like. Not bad, actually. These are solid aluminum bushings. See that they've actually held up decently. This might be good enough to throw in stock. Now the ball joint is not bad, but it's very loose. I'm curious to see what these look like. I, I, I think it's the uppers that are actually the problem in this thing. A couple too many uh, high-speed pursuits. You know, Duke boy action. Might have done a number on them. Not that I ever did that. You know, if you're a certain county sheriff with a certain jurisdiction and there was a lime green at the time, 72 Le Mans you were chasing, you know, it definitely wasn't me. Here's one of these. It feels kind of crappy, but nothing really sticks out to me is really worn out, which isn't making me feel very good. I was hoping to find something, you know, obvious. While this is all wide open and I can see the starter, I'm going to go ahead and replace it. Not because I need to, but because I scored this MSD Dynaforce starter for a freaking Pontiac on Holly's Clearance. Always check Holly's Clearance on their website. Uh, look at this thing. 
This is a $320 starter I got for $80. Give me a break. I couldn't pass that up. So uh, I'm going to just go ahead and stick this on there and shave about, I don't know, 20 pounds off the front of this. Off with the old. Put that in the, you know, the, the parts stash. Uh, in with the new. Got it on. Wasn't really anything to show, so I didn't bother, but... There's a lot more clearance up in here. It's probably another two, three inches between it and the exhaust pipe, which will be good whenever this eventually receives a set of headers. Got another stuck one. There we go. We are all stripped out now, and uh, it's bare to the world. But before I go slamming it back together, I'm going to clean everything up just kind of the podunk way. Except I'm going to use super clean. You know, you guys know me. I'm a big fan of oven cleaner, but Dollar Tree doesn't sell it anymore. Hands down, this is the most powerful stuff I've ever used. Uh, like, it's more powerful than oven cleaner. Not only that, it won't kill you with the fumes it creates. It is unbelievable. Look how easy. This is better than any engine degreaser I've ever used by a lot. It's actually so powerful, you kind of got to watch it. Make sure you're not spraying anything like aluminum or anything, I would say. But I will literally just spray this on, rinse it off with a garden hose, and it will look like brand new. It's unbelievable. Super clean, semi-official partner of Pole Barn Garage. No water. I just wipe it off. Look at that. I mean, that's undercoating that's left behind there. It's not going to pull that off, probably, but the grime is gone. Ah, look at that. Much better. Got about half my driveway out of the cross member. Well, now that we've cleaned everything off, it's, you know, time to rebuild everything again. About the same way I rebuilt it years ago. The more things change, the more they say or whatever. Now that our frame is completely rebuilt, we can go ahead and install some uh, good stuff. They etch which side is which into the control arms. So that's kind of handy. So I'm going to start by putting the upper control arm in. We'll get it kind of loosely bolted in, and then we'll get the lower control arm loosely bolted in. And then we're going to install our spring once we have them both. Got to have something to tie it to. Oh, wait, almost forgot. Actually, the kit comes with new bump stops for your frame, too, So, which is good because I was missing one. If it starts to sound like World War III around here, uh, it's because it's getting close to the 4th. Pretty much any time between July 1st and uh, June 30th, uh, you'll hear explosions all the time. I mean, it's just people exercising their God-given right to set off ordnance. So let's get these babies installed. Huh. It's raining a lot now. It's about to be raining inside here, probably. All right, we'll just leave that kind of loose. Voila. Now the thing to do would be to mount the spindle on the lower, put the spring in, then lift it up. I feel like we're going to have a little bit of a clearance issue with my inner fender here. I just had to roll the lip of it up in there with a pair of pliers. I didn't get to get any cutting instruments out. Kind of disappointed, but so I'm going to go ahead and put the spindle on. I know it's the passenger side spindle because uh, it's the one that the face of that bolt is completely ground off. Tighten down the lower ball joint. Yep, that's spec. A little bit more. A little bit more. A little bit more. Oh, that's spec. Yeah, that's good. It is very important to note how your spring goes in. So the flat part of the spring always goes up. The open side of the spring, it's still a round coil. It always goes down, and it must be seated against, there's gonna be a stop in your uh, control arm. A factory one will have two drain holes in it and that's where it stops. This one has that ramp that it sits up against. Up inside here, there's some fingers. You probably can't see it, but basically they sit inside of the coil of the spring. You wanna make sure that you're centered over that. Don't, you know, don't have it sitting off of it. Otherwise your car will sit wonky or up or any, you know, not, not, not good. You kinda gotta put your fingers up in the pocket here and feel coil spring fingers up in here. Once you get it up over them, you should be able to shake the spring back and forth just a little bit. Oh uh, yeah, I think we're good on those. Now we just gotta get a little tension on this. 
and I gotta rotate the spring into place as it comes up into position. You need to rotate a little bit, we can do with pry bar usually. It's got some like weld stuff or something that's hold it up, just a little bit of it. Oh, there it went, there it went. Yeah, it just had like a little bit of popcorn sticking up out of the bottom. You would not run into that if you installed it correctly instead of the dangerous way, but danger is my middle name since I bought a Jag. Yeah, you're not getting away from it. I deem it to be acceptable. Why these guys, AAA, honestly, parts company, decided let's send that guy our nice stuff. It either shows A, they're really awesome, or B, it's a really serious lapse in judgment. I mean, the good thing is about springs, if you don't have it quite right, usually a nice drive down a bumpy road will get you the rest of the way. I'm sure you'll find that in their instruction manuals. <laughs> Go hit some potholes. <laughs> Will you fall apart? Nope. That's one side done. Very nice. Now that it's all back together, I'm going to go back and hit the ball joints again. I'm pretty much just getting them as tight as I can because, uh, you know, they're ball joints. And you know, those those come out, uh, you're going to have a real bad day. Uh, like, probably the last one, actually. I'm going to go ahead and grease all this stuff while I'm thinking about it. Otherwise, God knows, I will forget. It's my special talent, forgetting the incredibly obvious stuff. Now we're just going to blaze through this. Make sure it's in the fingers. Nice. Alright, well I'm going to go ahead and throw the rotors on and put the new bearings in and stuff like that. One thing to note here, A, Timken bearings. Now these seals are actually made in Taiwan, unfortunately. But as far as a wheel bearing goes, which is the part that can, you know, really ruin your day forever, um, these are all made in the USA. Probably the best bearings money can buy. They cost the same price as any other Chinese made bearing. I don't have any brake clean to wipe the shipping oil off of this with, but I do have super clean, which is like brake clean, but super. Well, I think you've seen me pack bearings about 40,000 times by now. I don't know what more there is to show you. You put grease in your hand and, and you pack it till it comes out. All right, well, both brakes are on, looking good. Everything's back together as far as that goes. Uh, I am going to just throw some new steering components in. I got all Moog stuff. It's all made in the USA. I get a lot of argument on that. Like, oh, they're not made in the USA. Okay, it, it's right right there. Both the idler arm in there, some uh, tie rods, you know. Pretty basic stuff. One thing I do want to show you is I'm going to reuse these adjusting sleeves that I had. These are, I believe, UMI adjusting sleeves. These are a solid adjusting sleeve. I didn't get new ones because there's nothing wrong with these, I don't think. And the benefit to these is that in a typical adjusting sleeve, you have, you know, there's like, it's like a clamshell and two clamps that hold it down. But when you hit bumps and stuff, basically you're deflecting the tie rod and it's shortening the tie rod each time it deflects, bending basically in the middle. And uh, that's causing your wheel to toe in. It's called bump steer. And this completely eliminates that. Just adding these to your car will make a noticeable difference. But anyway, I'm going to take a measurement on each of these tie rods, see how long they are, and uh, then I'll take them apart and pull these apart, clean them up. I'm assuming if I measure each of these and then put my new tie rods together to the same length that it'll probably be somewhat close. I'm going to measure center to center. I mean, it's not going to be exact, but it should get me in the ballpark. Yeah, 18 and a half sounds pretty good to me, so the passenger side is 18 inches, the driver's side is 18 and a half. There you go. Basically, this thing's a, you know, like a turnbuckle, more or less. And so it's always a good idea to try to remember, you know, which way these things need to orient. On an A-body, the tie rod with the grease cert in the side is always the inner tie rod, so this is how it's going to be oriented. All right, probably the last thing I'm doing tonight is putting this sway bar in and also this front chassis brace and this ties the front frame horns together and if you know these A-body cars they're actually pretty flimsy in the front end and that helps alleviate that uh, that thing was I want to say around a hundred bucks or so that's gonna help strength at the front of this thing really well also I want to mention that UMI sway bars uh, they make them there in Pennsylvania uh, these are all heat bent so a lot of uh, cheaper ones will cold bend and when you cold bend something you fracture the steel these are heated 
and bent and forged into this shape. Uh, that is a hell of a piece of metal, <laughs> to say the least. This gets sandwiched like this, so the sway bar will bolt underneath it. And it just uses the sway bar bolts to bolt it in. It's an easy four bolt job. Install the bushings on the sway bar. They're clamshelled, so you just slide them on. Oh, Half-ass hung up in there now. Let's move over here, see if I can get decapitated. We need hammer. Hammer? Yeah, this will work. Anything's a hammer if you're desperate enough. I think I need to set the end links up just so I can have some idea of whether it's positioned laterally in the car correctly. I don't want to alarm anybody, but I actually got the instructions out. Now, I can't read, but I can look at pictures. And uh, it's kind of weird. It just You just use the bolt it comes with and just bolt it down into that little swivel thingy there. Boom. That is one beefy damn sway bar. Also, I can tell right now that I definitely need to throw some shims in that upper control arm. But again, we'll, we'll wait till I get tires on it. Wraps up the whole front end of the car. We got that done today. Tomorrow, we'll jump on the back. It's 1.30 in the morning. I need to go to bed. But, uh, you know, I don't, I don't get to sleep anymore because YouTube. Oh, God, it needs shocks. Sh okay, I'm going to force myself to put the shocks in. And well, these are, of course, Bilstein shocks. As far as a non-coilover shock goes, this is, you know, the name of the game here. You know, as it says, Gastrock is them for. Exactly. Couldn't have said it better myself. So I'm gonna just kind of hang it by the top nut for a second. That didn't work at all. The only uh, solution I have is to put a jack under the shock and try to lift it up into place. If that was just like a typical OEM shock, I could compress it no problem, but Bilstein's are the real damn deal. Uh, there we go. That's probably not how you do this at all. Again, there were instructions. I just, you know, you know I'm just not that smart. A screwdriver to get the nut on top of the bolt sticking through the control arm. Yeah, or drop it. So, yes, the way to install this is to draw the shock up. I imagine, and and then bolt it in. Pole Barn Garage, you know, once again proving there's just so many ways to skin a cat. And now we'll start on the back of the car, which is uh, quite a bit more simple than the front. We got the hard part out of the way first. It's always how I like to do things. You know, let me know how you do things. You tackle the hard stuff first, or the, or do you do you take the low hanging fruit? You know. First things first, I'm going to get this other faux UMI sway bar out of here. And you know, obviously keep this around for other projects as well. Kabooey! So I got the rear end supported with a jack. I'm gonna go ahead and pull the shocks out of it. And I'll probably let it drop just a little bit and then throw a couple jack stands under it to hold it up. I just want to drop it enough that I can get the springs out of it. Ah yes, GM shocks. Worst. Oh, the worst. I'm not really sure if I put some welds on top of these bolts or something back in the day, but I just got the nuts off of it without even having to put a wrench on it. Weird. Maybe I was smarter than I think I were. These shocks weren't bad at all to get off, thanks to my brilliant apparent ingenuity. Be able to lower this and then remove the springs. Usually these springs just pop right out, but apparently these have quite a bit of travel to them. So I've got a bunch of other things to put in here, like that shock tower brace and two frame braces. Enough stuff here, I think I'm just going to have to gut everything and start from scratch. Ow. It'd be really cool if the exhaust wouldn't have fallen off of the car, not going to lie. Whew. That's a UMI control arm. So here's a 10 year durability test. Uh, yeah, it looks fine. Well, that's a good jack stand. It's like playing Operation. These are pretty decent factory box control arms. Well, everything's out. Upper control arm bushing in the rear end housing still looks fine, so I'm actually going to leave those alone. I'm just going to hit everything with some super clean. And uh, hose the hell out of this thing. Get it all cleaned up and, you know, ignore all the holes. and. Yeah, I'll just keep doing what I've been doing for the last 15 years with this car, and it's uh, been working pretty good for me. Yeah, get that all dried off with the box fans, and we'll 
spray paint, I mean uh, rebuild everything and uh, then we'll start putting new stuff on. Right, so what we have here is a collection of pretty nice parts and an undeserving vehicle. We got a lower control arm, we have a frame brace and an upper control arm. I'm not sure how these work exactly. Connects upper control arm bolt to the lower control arm somehow. In a turn of events that is a surprise to nobody, it turns out I'm actually an idiot. The bolt goes all the way through here. This slides over it on the other side of this cross member. Then connects this down to the frame down here just to strengthen this corner of the frame. One little bit of information I probably should have mentioned. The, they come with lube for you to put on the face of the bushing, but also every bushing is greasable. So you just pump it full. You can do it afterwards too, it doesn't matter. These are really hard to get to if you don't grease them before. But use a marine grease so that it repels water. I mean, that's what the instructions say anyway. Just slurp it in there until it starts to poop out. Oh, yep, <laughs> it pooped a little bit. It's all right. Hey, it happens to the best of us. Poop a little bit of this stuff out on the face of the bushing. I think this is really just to protect it during installation more than anything. I'm gonna go ahead and hang the lower control arms in and just put one bolt in the front. And then we can go ahead and put the frame brace in there. And then we can go ahead and tie the rear end back up. This is the front lower control arm mount. And then that is the upper front control arm mount up there. And it just connects those two, basically triangulating this cross member here. Probably making this thing way stronger. Start the nuts on it. I'm going to leave everything loose for now. We'll go ahead and install the lower control arms into the rear end and then the upper control arms into the rear end. And handle this lower control arm into place. Smack her a little bit, you know. Sometimes you got to do that. Show it who's boss. No, I am in charge. Look at me. Look at me. I am in charge now. Now usually once you get one of them in, the rest of them just fall into place. So, I mean, that's not going to happen in this for sure because I said something. Now, the idea here is to get both lowers in. We'll be able to position the jack a little further back on the pumpkin and then kind of pivot to meet the upper control arms. That's the plan. Going to work? <laughs> no. Ah! Both lowers are loosely in. You can see we got to move about an inch to meet these uppers. Look at that. Huh. Uh, sometimes I'm a genius. Getting the ones that are inside the frame and are hidden are never any fun. It's kind of got to go on a fishing expedition for them. And don't forget to go back and tighten the jam nuts on these frame braces. These are probably going to crutch more problems than what they intended them to do. So, uh, you know, solid engineering, guys. I think we're ready to put our new springs in and then we'll be putting our shocks in, as well as the shock tower brace. Basically, the shock tower brace goes on top of the frame, bolt through here, through the frame, and then the shocks bolt below it. it ties both the shocks and their mounts together so that it's stiffer, and that just pops right in. So you don't gotta compress the rear springs on a nay body, generally. And they did supply new hardware for the shocks, but it's 3 8 hardware. So I'm gonna have to hog out all the holes in the frame, 3 8 which is no big deal. I'd rather have the sturdier hardware. It does say that you could use the uh, 5 16 hardware, you know, and it'd be fine, but almost a 3 8 hole in these Bilstein shocks. I think I'll just ream them out a little bit. Right now, there's probably some German Bilstein engineer going, that's what it's like, or something like that. Drop this up in there. Something like that. I'm not gonna lie to you guys, getting those bolts in, through that uh, chassis brace there. That was uh, not for the faint of heart. That took me the better part of an hour. That was kind of rough. That was definitely the hardest part of this entire install. But it's done now. And we can get our shocks bolted up, put our sway bar on, and we are done, guys. Now the sway bar is really the heart and soul of this operation. You know, a rear sway bar on any vehicle is a huge upgrade. Kind of excited now, I can actually jack the car up from the pumpkin again. Yeah, I couldn't do that with the factory style sway bar. The Holy Goat has a factory rear sway bar, I can't jack it up from the pumpkin on it either. And that's done. Look at that. It's a thing of beauty. 
All right, so you'd hit up a quick performance for a uh, nine inch for this thing without the 271 gears. This thing's gonna handle like it's on rails, probably break in half now, but at least it'll be flat doing it. So, uh, I am gonna go fix this exhaust pipe, put the transmission inspection cover back on, then we'll do a little, you know, redneck alignment on the front end. Hopefully it is good enough that we can test drive it. And I cannot forget to tighten the end links on the front sway bar, but we can't do that until the car is at ride height on the ground. How the hell did this even happen? Like, what? <laughs> I mean, clearly it broke it off, but, well, don't you think I'd be able to put this back on? Well, I just kind of bent and shaped that, used an exhaust pipe expander, yeah, it's definitely going to leak really bad, but I don't know, maybe we could drive the car. It's all I care about right now. Yeah, we're pretty much ready to put the car on the ground. I mean, you are supposed to set camber with the car sitting on the ground, but I can already tell just by looking at this, it's going to need a little bit. And yes, this is my official camber bubble level. It's pretty positive right now, and we want it to be just a tick negative. So when the car's lifted up, I really probably want to see it about centered, and then when it sits down, it'll kind of lean in. I think. Uh, the way you adjust camber on an A-body car, or you know, most full-frame cars, is you loosen these two bolts and put shims in between here, and that pulls in the upper control arm, and then pulls your wheel like this, to negative. Positive, negative. I'm just going to put two shims in here, like two eighth-inch shims, and that's probably going to pull this up centered. I put a couple shims in there. Stood it up pretty straight. Again, Really need the car on the ground to know for sure, but I think that's probably fairly close. I think I could probably even roughly set in the toe if it looks like it's too far off uh, once I put the tires on. It's not going to be perfect. It's going to need an alignment, but we just got to get it good enough to get to an alignment shop eventually, and that's not going to happen in time to get this video out. All right, the wheels are back in place. Now this one looks okay if we assume the steering wheel is straight, which it looks like it is. Uh, this one... Not so much. I got a little off there, I think. It lowered the hell out of this thing. I don't hate it. Need that front end to settle in a little bit. And it'll look pretty wicked, but somebody queue up the war, man, because you got a low rider. In other news, the settling the suspension, I just kind of sat on the fender a few times. Pulled that tie rod in. I think we're good there. Camber doesn't look too wacky need to pull this one out. We'll do all this with a tape measure, but uh, I'm going to get it eyeballed and then we'll go to the tape measure. Bubbles pretty much right in the middle. That's pretty good, really. It could use maybe just a one more shim, maybe. Yeah, this one, same thing. Bub the bubble's in the middle. Probably ought to put one more shim in it and just kind of tow. You want a l like one degree of negative camper which, my experience, is about half a bubble over that line. In a turn of events that'll surprise nobody, I actually managed to put the center link in the car in backwards, and the tie rods in backwards. I didn't know you could do that, but it uh, probably serves me right for working on no sleep. Let me undo that. <laughs> well, it's true that sometimes my own idiocy even amazes myself. I got everything fixed and it's all back to normal and weirdly everything fits better now. I don't get it, but I'm under here tightening up the sway bar and I think I got the toe halfway close, so we'll check it. Basically what you want is your sway bar to be level. So it's tightened down till it's level, tighten the jam nuts, you're good to go. All right, we gotta settle the suspension. You could either roll the car back and forth or hop on it a little bit and man this thing is stiff now so what i'm going to do is get a measurement from the tread of the tire all the way across measure it to the same tread on that tire that'll give me the dimensions of the front then i will pick the same tread on the back side of both tires and then measure across that so say it's 70 inches in the back and 68 in the front that means it's towed in on the front two inches well, we're just going to shoot for even. You want to be like in the middle of the tire. That's not really possible here. So, second tread from the inside. Ah, 60 and one quarter. I don't know if I can get under this thing. I'll duct tape the tape measure to this 
tire to uh, try to get some kind of a measurement here, but eh, I'm not feeling it. I got about 61 and an 8, which makes sense by my eyeball. They are towed in quite a bit. We'll extend both tie rods out until they starts to kick the wheel out this way. We had 60 and a quarter, 61 and an eighth. We need to find the middle between that, so that'd be like 60 and three quarter, give or take. Both measurements are about 60 and three quarter. To my eyeball, looking at it with the line of the fender, it looks pretty even. Typically you want a little bit of toe in. I mean, it's about as messed up as a soup sandwich, you know? It's not gonna be anywhere near correct. So just bear that in mind as we go drive the car tomorrow. Looks pretty good sitting out here. I think the front has already settled in more. Let's go see how bad I've screwed up the front end alignment of this thing. We'll go first stop car wash, second stop DMV. So you get to go to the DMV with me. I mean, you guys are pretty lucky. All right, first test. Can I drive down my own driveway? I couldn't before. The car just drug it, graded it all the time. quite a bit better. That must not have the alignment too far off. Carve some corners now. Wow! <laughs> this car's a riot. Alright, so this big dip in the road here is always terrible. Let's see how bad it grinds out. I'll slow down for it. What? No way. I didn't even try to bottom out. It's like the only car I own that does a bottom out there. Let's try the roundabout, the lateral G test. Here we go. I've got a can of soda between my legs. Will I spill it? Jesus. It doesn't even affect it. I keep forgetting about the horrible vacuum leak this thing has. Am I just denying it or what? I, I'm always forgetting about that one. I don't know why it's still pulling to the right a little bit. I'm not sure what that is. That may be a brake. Well, let's see if it feels hot or something. Obviously it needs an alignment, but then that'll probably help as well. But I, this is good enough to putt around on, I think. Oh, it definitely handles better. I think we can push the limits of the Thunderer Mach 3 R72 tires I have on this thing now. Uh, I can push it until they start to break free and, you know, it should, without a stickier tire. Can't get much better than that. Might have to get a set of Nittos. I'm just trying to figure out why that, you know, what's with the, the pulling. I really hope the car's not bent or something like that. Hopefully they can align it out of it. I'm gonna wash the barn find off of it. See if it breaks. See how long the exhaust stays on it. I mean, that's really, that's the real test here. There's some good curves on this road, but I need to slow down and let these old people get ahead of me so that I can do something fun.
I just took those 45 mile an hour curves at 80 to 90 miles an hour with one hand. I, I'm gonna say it, it made some improvements. The exhaust leak's getting progressively worse. Uh, I really hope it doesn't fall off because I have no tools. I don't even have a jack. Let me take this opportunity to tell you how horrible the Missouri DMV is. Um, you know, I, I have a title that was dated from 2017 on a car I bought. Nope, can't title it without a notarized bill of sale. Why? Why wouldn't I just pay the penalty on it? I don't what? I just made an appointment at Robert's Tire in Harrisonville, Missouri to get an alignment done. So uh, hopefully they see this, you know. You guys, you know, help me out on the... But uh, they couldn't squeeze me in today, so... I have to wait a few days. The hillbilly alignment's just gonna have to do. Fun fact, my first job was at that Dairy Queen right there. Uh, apparently it caught on fire though when they're closed. Let's see how it does on uh, some open highway. That's pretty good. I'm not that far off on the alignment. It's just got a little, little pole to it that they need to get out of it. to get home. The exhaust is literally about to fall off of this thing. It's much louder now. With that, I believe we can deem UMI's handling kit totally idiot proof. Me being the idiot. A weekend and I had this done. I worked on it Saturday and Sunday. Done. What other major upgrades can you do in two days to your car? and just change it completely. An absolute blast to drive now. The hood's up because it has a has a misfire. Now it, it's something I think I fouled a plug, maybe, I hope. I don't know. Been wailing on it pretty hard all day, so. We got more work to do yet, but that's done. So big thanks to UMI for providing that kit. And if you want one, check it out in the description, go to their website and just shop around. You don't gotta get the whole kit. You could start with maybe control arms or sway bars or the rear sway bar combined with the front control arms. Maybe just those two would make a tremendous difference in any car. Uh, but if you can swing the whole kit, that's the way to go. Anyway, thanks guys, thanks for watching. We'll see you next time when we get back on the Silver Dollar Chevy probably working on the bed of that thing on Pole Barn Garage.